100,000 subscribers. Now in my last video, you could say I was pretty heavily pessimistic at the suggestion of someone beating the system and really persevering to be a success. Every success on YouTube is a fluke. To be a little more optimistic, I thought we could stop and watch the first video that I ever created for the Quentin Reviews YouTube series. For context, I was 15 or 16 when I made this. Hello, uh... There he is. My name is Quentin Kyle Hoover. Oh, yeah, say the full name. You gotta get that branding out. Uh, this is a little series I've been thinking about doing for a long time now, called, uh, Quentin Reviews. Quentin so, Reviews, there, said, there it goes. I've been, this, I've been thinking about doing this for a long time, but I Have never you? really had the driving force or the reason to do it. What made me want to do a review series, then? Just this little obscure television program called, No. Uh, no, don't. Don't do it. Doctor Who. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. And everyone's doing a great Fuck job you. God books, damn it. Comic, Australian coinage. Shut up. Like I said, there's been a lot of stuff. And everyone's just been doing a fantastic job oh, Fuck me. Oh, it's the worst. It really is. Show, ironically. Shut up. During the series, I'm gonna take a deep look at Doctor Who. Are you? Books, comedy, books, audios, uh, TV episodes, uh, uh, just about everything. All at your request. Yeah. But more importantly, I'll watch 50th anniversary specials come and go and review them with you. No, no, you won't. So You'll just give up before then. Fuck Potter's you. Potter's Lane to Mondas. From oh, Mondas shut to up. I just, I want to die. The point I was trying to make in showing you that truly unwatchable clip is that that person, that socially unacceptable ball of grease, he managed to get more than a hundred thousand subscribers on his YouTube channel, the same series that he introduced in that terrible, terrible little clip. He somehow managed to go from a hundred and forty subscribers to a hundred and forty thousand subscribers in just under a year. Can you imagine that? If someone like that can manage to succeed on this website, to not only get popular enough, but good enough to continue making videos, if that person can do it, I don't think there's anything stopping any of you from doing it much better. Anyways, I'm gonna review the third Timmy Turner movie now. I hope everyone's alright with that. Quinton is an average Joe, whose life's just not the same. Money, fame, and power means he can't really complain. In my first review, which, at around 50 minutes, is one of my longest, I went down the long list of positives that made the original Fairly Odd Parents somewhat enjoyable. And I then meticulously pinpointed how the motion video sequel failed to pin even one of these down, missing out on the comedic cues, the charm of the relationships, and most of all, the heart. I've said in the past that judging something like how bad a movie truly is, especially in a relative sense, can be especially difficult. But I can easily put forward that, out of everything that I've reviewed on this channel, Grow Up Timmy Turner is the movie that I would very much least like to watch again. It was much to my dismay to then have to acknowledge that this little project had not one, but two sequels. One set at Christmas, and one set in the summer. I oddly enough found myself pretty universally not hating the Christmas special, although that might have been brought into doubt by the context of how much stress and confusion these films tend to put my brain through. <coughs> One of the focal elements of these films is the casting of Drake Bell as Timmy Turner, a directorial decision so terrible that it just ends up seeming surreal. Drake Bell has been a bit of a public spectacle in recent years. Sometime in 2014, it was widely reported that he was more than half a million dollars in debt. Then, earlier this year, there was another controversy when it was revealed that Josh Peck had neglected to invite Drake to his wedding, probably out of suspicion that Drake would start pocketing the silverware. However, there was recently a cheerful reunion. Please Wait, don't is this Facebook to be nice to me! There does come to a point where I have trouble discussing this series as often as I have, 
I think there's a limit to how many times you can make a video about how you don't like something before you start coming across like an obsessed egomaniac. From my experience, that number is usually less than three. A lot of people that I talk to about these films, be it my fans or my friends, are shell-shocked to discover how many of them have come out. However, once you've seen the first two, you begin to appreciate why a third was needed in the first place. Grow Up Timmy Turner spent a considerable amount of time setting itself up as the ultimate finale to the franchise, illustrating an outcome where Timmy would be put off becoming an adult for such a long period of time simply to stay with Cosmo and Wanda. At the end of the film, Tommy finally decides to grow up, but he is allowed to keep his fairies as long as he uses them exclusively for good deeds. A fairly odd Christmas, not being able to tell a story without Tommy learning some sort of inane moral lesson, decided to reveal that even with the power of God's spite himself, he was super, super bad at doing charity work without destroying entire ecosystems along the way essentially leaving in this gap where once again there was no final page to Tommy Tuner's story. Thus, a fairly odd summer again seeks out to give a finale to the franchise that's ended too many times for it to be believable, which explains the introductory scene, which has Tommy working a boring office job for which he is obtained for the summer. And I'm sitting here because... Jordan gave you a summer job because you're grown up now and we all agree that you should work for a living, remember? Oh yeah, I have a Job. Oh god, I, I just can't believe we're here right now. There's something incredibly depressing about seeing a childhood icon be forced to go through the motions as he attempts to take on the responsibilities of an adult despite very much still being a child. One could easily argue, given the original pretenses of the TV show, that Tommy working in a boring office job while hanging on to his fairies due to a strange obsession with childhood was the only natural outcome to everything that we knew about him. But that doesn't make it any less disparaging. It'd be like if they did a Gilligan reunion and it was just a bunch of shots of some skeletons on an island. Personally, I've always felt that when it comes to shows about children, the best what-if future stories paint their adult counterparts as totally different people. Sometimes I try to imagine someone who only knew me as a child reacting to who I am now, and it makes me realize how irrelevant that version of myself is to who I am right now. That's also why the best future Simpson episodes are the ones where Bard is on the Supreme Court, and not the one where his elementary school has been turned into an apartment. With Tommy here, it's like he's been plucked straight straight out of being 10 years old and put into this situation. Ironically, that exact same concept was the plot of the first episode of the show. But in that instance, the literal exploration was about what would happen if a child tried being an adult. Here, it's like time has passed normally and he's just failed to surpass the fifth grade. It's the story of an adult failing to be an adult. Even worse, you have a summer job! <laughs> I have this theory that the actor playing Cosmo slowly over the years has started to really dislike playing the character, or even the show in general, which has possibly led him to put less and less effort into his performance. That or he's aged so much that he legitimately doesn't know how to pull off the Cosmo voice anymore. He's now slipping into this weird falsetto home which just doesn't sound like he's trying and it barely fits the character at all. Of course I'm okay! I'm Cosmo! Oh no. So Tommy apparently has only taken this job because he wants to impress his girlfriend, Tootie. I mean, I mean Tootsie. Is that what I called her? Whatever. But he just doesn't feel content in his new job, even though it gives him a lovely view of ho 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 ho! It's pretty evident that, at this point, they're just reusing the same 3D models from the first movie. And anything else, they're just putting as little work into as possible. Just look at how polished and professional these backgrounds look, and then look at the fairies! What else is there to say? Look at how lazy this shot with the dump truck is. Look at it. It looks like something they would show on Nick Jr. to teach kids how to count to three. What is the logic with this window placement? Is this building just like one room and a bunch of slime behind a wall? Why isn't the window curved? If a building's a toilet bowl that's curved all the way around, then the window should be curved too. Maybe it's my fault for giving a shit. This legitimately looks like something out of a Video Brincato animation. Those Spanish motherfuckers getting jobs at Nickelodeon now? So Crocker sees them arrive, apparently because the main characters at this point are making no attempt to hide the fairies. 
You know, that used to be a big thing. You couldn't go around with the fairies on public because they'd get taken away. But now they're just kind of out and open all the time. In fact, it's nearly a consistent narrative beat that someone in the film will see the fairies when he arrives at Dimsdale. And it's during this sequence that we're finally introduced to our true main protagonists. Two kids. These two kids are like a paste. A bland, unsheared paste that has been put over the film. It's not as if they're filler, because they're essential to the plot. But it's more that they're just so forced and so bland that you just want to kill yourself. So the inevitable setup for these two is that at the end of the movie they're gonna get their own fairies. And the reason that they need fairies is that they're rich and their parents don't care about them. They're basically Remy from the original show. And just like Remy, they kind of come across as kids that don't really need fairies. Keep in mind that Tommy goes through so much stuff that it just feels like no one else but him deserves fairies at some point. But in general, I just think it's not great that the same things that could be fixed with fairies here could be fixed with a family counselor. So the kids are supposed to go to Hawaii, but their parents are busy, and so they do the responsible thing and hire Vicky as their babysitter. Then we're briefly shown Poof having a premonition before moving on. And we quickly find out that this is because of the presence of Foop. The Anti-Poof. So in the original series, the Anti-Fairies were a group of occasionally recurring villains who were essentially the direct opposite of the fairies. While fairies attempted to bring joy by granting wishes, the Anti-Fairies created havoc by feeding on bad luck. One of the main points about the Anti-Fairies was that for every fairy, there was an evil counterpart to be found in the Anti-Fairies. For instance, two of the main characters often shown would be the rather intelligent Anti-Cosmo and the amazingly stupid Anti-Wanda. It's a simple gimmick that I've often had a soft spot for. I was actually shocked to find out that before Foop's entrance into the show, the Anti-Fairies were only seen twice. Once in Season 2 and once in the Jimmy Neutron crossover. Even though they weren't as heavily used as I had originally presumed, they left a huge impression on anyone who saw those two episodes. Soon, however, it started to feel like they were being used a little bit too often, and this started with the choice to introduce an anti-Poof. Foop is the total opposite to Poof because there is something to say about him. Seriously, can we talk about that again? Some time ago I watched the first episode with Chloe, and it was bad. But my main takeaway was that it took an amazingly long time for me to realize that Poof was no longer in the show. Poof adds so little to every scene that he's in that they took him out and I did not notice. Foop, however, is this odd sort of whiplashian antagonist, who has become both a renegade and a leader to the Anti-Fairies, meaning that he is equally capable of appearing entirely on his own. He also occasionally makes a poop joke just to remind you that he is indeed still a baby. Like I've been saying, the ultimate change for the show constantly bringing back old villains has led to Foop being used far more often than he really should be meaning that he's really outgrown whatever potential was there on day one. Also, do you remember the dog? The dog had an anti-fairy too. Exactly as planned. <laughs> Let's never talk about this again. So Tommy ends up visiting his girlfriend at her job, which is sort of this sciencey hippie project where they're trying to save dolphins or something. If you'll remember, the first film revealed that Tootsie likes animals. It's just Tommy, trees, and animals. That's what she's into. Anyway, she has this chapstick thing that's supposed to save the whales or something, and Tommy accidentally ends up taking it because he's been using chapstick a lot. Then he visits his dad, who has a check that he needs for work since he is helping organize an event in Hawaii. Tommy accidentally takes it. And later he realizes that he has both his dad's thing and his girlfriend's thing and that they're both in Hawaii and that he needs to go to Hawaii to give them those things. Shortly before this, he receives a promotion from Jargon, who, guess what, is going to Hawaii. Jargon wants him to guard a huge crystal thing that supposedly powers all of the magic in all of the world. You see, this is actually a big retcon, or should I say, cover-up within the Fairly Odd Parents universe. You see, in the original series, all of the magic in Fairy World, and thus the universe, was actually created by a giant wand in Fairy World. Later, it was revealed that that wand was actually powered by people who believed in fairies, which is why the characters keep going out of their way to convince Crocker that fairies are real, despite the fact that it destroys his social life. This is a literary concept which has become known as philanderization, where the more the characters are represented in fiction, the more likely it will be that they will become unjustifiable sociopaths. And if you really tick me off, 
I'm gonna run you down with my car. The point is that this ball is now what powers all of the fairies in the movie. And Tommy figures out that it's portable in the sense that he can briefly disconnect it and take it with him to Hawaii. Also, Crocker is in Hawaii. Crocker justifies these movies. I legitimately love all of the Crocker scenes. I would probably watch like a Crocker solo film. Not even like on TV, like I would go to the theater and watch a Crocker solo movie. I've heard that a lot of the people involved in these films have had sort of lackluster careers since then. And I just hope to God the guy playing Crocker is doing alright. He deserves it. Naturally, I gotta be honest and say that there are a few characters that are just kinda like watching. Whenever Tommy's dad has a bunch of scenes, the writing of the original show kinda floats back in and you start to laugh once again. And then Drake Bell walks back into the room and you're like, Oh yeah, that's what they were going for, wasn't it? You see, he's carrying the thing that supposedly creates all of the magic in his world, but I, I, I think that's wrong. I think he's carrying the thing that destroys all magic. So Crocker ends up meeting Foop and they decide to form sort of an evil alliance. This is literally the exact same thing I described in my first review for what a good Fairly Odd Parents movie would be. And can you imagine one goofy side villain teaming up with another goofy side villain to finally make a solid force against Timmy Turner? That would be cool, and interesting, and a good movie! This is none of those things! But somehow the attempt here feels cheapened by the fact that I barely know or care about one of the two villains being featured in this dynamic. Then they stumble into a mysterious cave and decide that the only logical thing to do is to steal the magical orb thing, bring it to the cave, and then drop it into the lava. Also, this happens... <laughs> what are you guys, a couple of fugitives? <gasps> Vicky? Oh, oh no. I have seen all three of these movies several times over, and I am fairly confident that in this entire trilogy they have not once, not once, in any way, managed to mention that Tootie and Vicky are sisters. Think about all the scenes that they have together, all the little dynamics that they try and pull, and not once does anyone ever mention the fact that they are siblings. Crocker and Foop are eventually able to steal the orb thing by doing a long-form dance routine in front of the pair, while Foop has turned himself into a human and is doing a Mumpkey Jones cosplay, and somehow that ends with them stealing the orb. They figure out that they've been tricked and they begin scouring the whole island for their lost bag, leading to Tootie teaming up with the two kids while Cos one Wanda get trapped in a fridge, and Drake Bell just kinda... Drake Bell just kinda wanders around. I like to imagine that this whole part of the movie was written around what Drake Bell was doing. Like, he had no direction, they had no way to control him, so they just kind of filmed him wandering around the island set. Like this, right here, that's just Drake Bell being himself. Me Drake Bell done shooting movie. Me Drake Bell want sit down. Me Drake Bell see woman? Meanwhile, Tootsie and the kids run around in this little bike carriage thing while they're chasing Crocker. Crocker's in this pineapple bike, and they're being chased by Vicky. Basically, this is both the worst and the greatest chase scene of all time. Crocker gets to the volcano and tries to throw the rock in, but the Facebook Live reaction emojis convince him not to do it. So instead, Foop tries to throw it in, but Tommy tries to stop him and they both fall in. And you could have it all. He sacrificed everything just for the sake of his friends. Truly this is a heartfelt moment and a legitimate end to one of the greatest childhood icon- uh, fuck it, I, we all know it's a fake out. It's, Drake Bell's gonna come back and it's gonna be all, bring Jake- J bring Drake Bell back, we all know what's gonna happen, just do it! Say what? So Tommy has now been resurrected as a fairy. And he's now voiced by Tara Strong again. Blessed be. And he looks like a child with wings. That's it. I quit. No, I'm done. Fuck you. Fuck you. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you. I deserve better and you know it. I like to imagine that they wrote this part because Drake Bell went mysteriously missing halfway through production of the movie and they didn't have an ending. May I have this dance duty? <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna take some getting used to. What? Being a pedophile? Cause that's what you are now. Look at this, look at this. Tootie keeps saying that she's totally excited by all this, but look at her face. Look at her face. That's the face of someone who just got punked. 
That's the face of someone who just got tricked into being a pedophile. Look at that weak smile. The horror has reached her mind, but she's trying to stop it from reaching her face. This is easily the most disturbing thing that's ever come out of these movies. Guess what, Vicky? Mom and Dad say you can be our nanny for as long as they want. This isn't for- <laughs> So Kazuma and Wanda become the fairies of the kids introduced for the movie. Foop is sent to the moon, and everyone dances off into the night as Poof says goodbye to the audience. Not in a black person's voice because I guess they decided that was too much. Is that the line Nickelodeon? Is that the line you don't cross again? This is usually the part of the video where I pick up a remote prop, I press the stop button even though the audience can't see that's a stop button, they presume it's the stop button because the review part of the video is over, and then I just slam dunk that shit into the floor. Just, just full on Michael Jordan, or who, is that base, is that basketball, I don't fucking care. The point is, that I didn't want to do this. Okay, I didn't want to have to sit here, at no point is there a human being, no human has ever woken up one day and been like, do you know what I want to do today? I want to watch the third Timmy Turner movie. I want to watch the Timmy Turner live action Fair the Odd Parents movie starring Drake Bell that's set in the summer and has and has the the poof in it. That's what I feel like doing. No, I did this because you wanted me to do it. It's what you wanted. But do you care what I think? Do you care what I have to say? You could ask anyone about this goddamn movie. They wouldn't have to say it. They could tell you what to say about it. Ugh. Why do I mean, why do I ask my goddamn cat about the stupid movie? Ask your friends about the movie. Ask, ask your parents about the movie. Why do we ask Jamis about that movie? Considering he's been hiding behind that door for six fucking weeks like I wouldn't have fucking noticed. If you don't come out right now, I'm gonna come in there and ruin your entrance. Ha ha ha! Tis I, Jamis! That's not true. That's impossible. Yes, RoboFan. When last we met, we were trapped in the back of a police vehicle. A rapist police vehicle. I don't think it was a police vehicle. Yeah, I remember. I was there. And then you weren't. Well, yeah, because he didn't really put both of my handcuffs on, so when he stopped the car, I just kind of got out. Continuity. Ooh, for you, RoboFan, it's been merely several months. But for me, it's been several months and I've spent the decades searching for the artifacts of Orbulon across time and space to clear my criminal record. Uh-huh. So far, I've only found the orb, which I, I already had, I think. But with this orb! With this orb, indeed, I, there's so many merciless things I can do to you. I can hit you in the toes with it. That'll really hurt. I might break one. I can, I can hit you in the knees with it. You ever had a bruised knee before? That shit hurts. I can hit you in the head with it. This, this is a circle, it's got, it's got one play, it's not an orb, it, it, it would hurt though. You ever been hit in the head with a sphere? Don't laugh. I've got the, I've got these scissors, not only do they cut, do they cut paper and fabric well, but they, they, they also cut the fabric of time and space, I swear it! That's how I got in your, that's how I got in the room! I cut through dimensions to get here! That's what I did, faggot! That's what I did to find you! You know how many toddlers have been killed with a bag? So maybe you don't fear for your life, but what if I wreck your shit? <laughs> Look at all this shit! This is like hundreds of dollars, Steve, and this! What if I broke him? What if I broke him? What if I broke something? Who's this? Who's this? What are these? React! Say something to me! Say something! Ah! It all makes sense now. I get it. I understand. I get it. It's all a joke and John just wasn't invited. Ah! Ah! With every death, I become stronger! If you leave right now, I'll give you this DVD. Huh. Fuck yeah. It's 20, it's 24 it though. It's, it's pretty good. You know, War Girl's pretty, it's a pretty good show, honestly. It's underrated, it, was, it wasn't broadcast a lot. Uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. That's the Mr. Rogers sequel. I don't like that one. Wildcrats are all right too. Did you know that Lamar Burton was a? Uh, it was it was in Stargate. Leave. All right. Well, hey man, congrats on a on a hundred billion thousand subscribers, whatever. Uh, that's that's a big number. It means a lot. It's not everybody gets that. It's, I'm proud of you. I I feel like I've I feel like I've contributed in this in some way. Uh, before I go, do you mind if I do you mind if I plug my Facebook group? It's about the it's about the Robotech novelization. It's just it's just a real now. Gotcha. Take take care.
I'll be this way. Goodbye. Forever. It's the last time you'll see me. Ever. Don't want to say it. All right. A fairly odd summer isn't very good. There's this weird trend with made-for-TV Nickelodeon movies. They usually come in a pack of three, and the third one is usually at the point where no one wanted to make them anymore. A Fairly Odd Summer ends up feeling like that. One thing you can say is that it's obvious that this was a film where a lot of laughs were happening behind the scenes. Because of this, one can at least admit that there is a smooth feeling to the production itself that wasn't really present in the first two films, meaning that some of the main cast actually ends up being funny on screen even if they're not really given much. The writers, it feels like, have heavily struggled to keep bringing out elements of the original series to a live-action format, and ultimately their go-to card for all three of these films has been Crocker. Don't get me wrong, Crocker is pretty great, but it just feels like he's continuously featured because he's the only thing that's actually good. But the fact that he's one of the only classic villains who was pretty predominantly featured in a positive way makes me think that the creators of some of these films just didn't understand what made the original series so great. The ending to this film will always be the part that survives the most in my brain, and thus it will always hold the most consequence towards why I don't like this film. I imagine this was possibly done because Drake Bell didn't want to do a fourth movie, or maybe they just thought it would actually be a good ending for Timmy, one that allows him to constantly see his parent-like figures without always being around them in kind of a weird way. But it's handled in the most awkward of ways, and honestly there was just no good way to execute that idea. Yeah. In the end, A Fairly Odd Summer is supposed to be just that, an ending. And personally, I don't think it's a great one, but I am happy to be done watching these movies, and if someone out there can find something positive to see in this mess, then I can only wish them the best. And with that, I've been Quinn Kyle Hoover, and that's all you need. The peace to Orbulan's palace! Where'd you go? Did you leave? Did you leave? Where'd you go? Where's my life become? I used to run a fan site. I used to have people who liked me. Now I can't die! Existence is pain. Life's a joke. Reality's a construct. He's gone. My dad's gone. Am I gay? Well, then that happened. <laughs> <laughs>